My name is Tupac Shakur, and I attend Tamapai High School, and I'm 17 years old. Each generation finds its own heroes and prophets. In 1996, one tattooed political poet whose music and voice reached out to millions of people across the world was silenced. The media portrayed him as a thug, focusing public attention more and more on his alleged crimes rather than his music. He spoke of poverty, injustice, equality, and the harsh realities of life. Was he just a reflection of the times or someone who made a difference? to me that some kids think that he's still alive. It's almost funny to me because he couldn't have been quiet this long. There'd have been no way in the world he could be quiet this long. I think Tupac's alive is any one of us in the sense of I can still feel him. He is still alive. As far as I'm concerned, you know, we don't die, we multiply. I think Tupac's here every day because I see the tattoo on my daughter's shoulder right now. And it's so lifelike, you know. The 1960s were a time of turmoil and liberation. Americans were confronted with the power of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. One group to rise from this atmosphere was the Black Panthers. The group believed that the only way to achieve black liberation was to form a black militia armed with enough firepower to fight the oppressive white government. Afeni Shakur, Tupac's mother, was in the forefront of the Black Panther movement. My mother was a Black Panther, and she was really involved in the movement, you know, just Black people bettering themselves and things like that. He was a soldier from here. You, you seen it was the upbringing. You seen Pac, he had the fire in his eye. You can't uh, exempt this guy from his environment. His mother was a Panther Party operative. She was socially conscious. She guided her boy in, in, in the right direction. Huey Newton was in his 20s when he started the Panthers, who was a voracious reader. And Tupac probably wanted to replicate that. He wanted to imitate that. Afeni Shakur, pregnant with Tupac, was arrested on conspiracy charges along with 20 other Black Panthers. Accused of plotting to blow up Manhattan landmarks, she faced up to 150 years in prison. She successfully defended herself and was acquitted of all charges. One month after the trial, Tupac Amaru Shakur was born met him the first time at the Armory in New York City at 168th Street, had gone over to hear Minister Louis Farrakhan speak at a rally, and Afeni was there with him. He was a tiny baby, and a, a baby was about two months old. Afeni never revealed publicly who Tupac's father was. She lived briefly with Matulu Shakur, who would become Tupac's stepfather and spiritual advisor during his younger years. Matulu was eventually taken from Tupac. Dr. Matulu Shakur, political prisoner. Been locked down since 86, 87. He got 60 years on the RICO Act. Was accused of, accused allegedly of liberating the side of Shakur, bank robbers, armored truck heist, all that. I was a man in Tupac's life who had a commitment. I was a man in Tupac's life who probably had a commitment to the struggle more than to the family. He learned a lot from the people, not from what was said by the people. He, he hung around with dope fiends, he hung around with gangsters, he hung around with oppressed people, he hung around with struggled. People, people were struggling for things. He listened to the meetings. He was at all the meetings. You know, he was hanging. He was a part of that struggle as a young child. In 1981, the repression was intensified, and him and the family and Secretary had to go and run from the, the FBI, and the FBI would go into their schools and intimidate them and try to find out where I was at, uh, where his aunt was at, where Sai was at. Uh, most children don't know that. 
it was like I was given the responsibility before I wanted it. And so now I can't really differentiate what great responsibility is because I've had it for so long. Uh, Fanny and Pac are a lot alike, you know what I'm saying? They're very articulate. And uh, it, she's a good person to learn things from. My mother taught me three things, respect, knowledge, search for knowledge. It's an eternal, eternal journey. That's like my hair cut the line, 360 degrees by knowledge, always. And, and she taught me to not be quiet, to, if there's something in my mind, speak it. Years of internal fighting and the efforts of the FBI to undermine the Panthers eventually led to the party's demise. All the party members had a hard time uh, right after the party was dissolved of getting into the workforce, and especially somebody like Afeni. You know, she ended up homeless on the streets of New York, of Boston. You know, she had a hard time. She ended up on drugs. We moved out of New York because um, all of these, because of my mother's choices, they figured out who she was and she couldn't keep a job. That should be illegal. So she lost her job, and of course, we were, like, stranded in New York. With the dissolve of the Black Panther Party and a search for a better life, a and her family left Harlem. So we moved to Baltimore. Baltimore has the highest rate of teenage pregnancy, the highest rate of AIDS within the um, black community, the highest rate of um, teens killing teens, and the highest rate of teenage suicide, and the highest rate of blacks killing blacks in Baltimore, Maryland. And this is where we chose to live. So as soon as I got there, being the person I am, I said, no, no, I'm changing this. So I started a Stop the Killing campaign and um, Safe Sex campaign and AIDS prevention campaign and everything. Tupac auditioned for and was accepted into the Baltimore School for the Arts. Majoring in acting, he became a model student. In Baltimore, he wrote his first rap. It was about gun control and inspired by the death of a close friend. Again, looking for a better life, Fanny packed up the family and moved to California. Tupac believed leaving that school affected him so much. He saw that as the point where he got off track. And I came to California to escape that, escape that violence that I escaped New York for, then I went to Baltimore, escaped Baltimore for, came to California. Come to Marin City, I've seen already deaths. I mean, this lady slashed a man's throat because he spit on a kid. This is uh, door one, building 89. It's in Marin City in the jungle, the J-Town. This was kind of like the place we wrote a lot of the first, you know, the first songs. Okay. Come here, follow me with your camera. Because, first of all, he stayed in the living room. His sister had my son's room. Baby, this was Tupac's sister's room. Yeah, this is where we used to write all the songs at, yeah? Sexual yeah. used to be mad because we was always... And that, that side yeah. window, when his mama leave, all the girls come to the back, and he let me into the slide. Okay, so when she I'm in my room, room, so when I'm in my room, laying right here in my bed, and something go. I was your tiny room. Sometimes here in the living room, we'll do do some writing, but you know, his mama would kick us out, send us to the back. During the early days, we were we were broke. We wanted to be rappers, and, and we got befriended by a lot of people in the street, like dope dealers pimps, all the people that you think are the wrong type of people, I can honestly say that none of those people tried to draw us into that lifestyle. So a lot of people got behind us and helped us get there. We got caught up in the whole aspect of wanting a ball, wanting to have jewelry, wanting to have nice cars from watching them. But the revolutionary aspect of it came from Tupac's mother and, and, um, and the things she was teaching him, he taught a lot of us. I feel like if you can't respect yourself, then you can't respect your race, then you can't respect another's race, then you can't respect, you know, it just has to do with respect, like my mother taught me. So um, what, we, what we're what doing is starting to Black Panthers again in Marin City, just getting first teaching pride and then teaching education, and then we'll see where it goes from there. This is the stairwell in the jungles. We used to sit right here in, in the hallways, smoking weed. And Busting raps. In the garbage chute. That's where everybody used to write their raps at. Now we're gonna go up to the top. This is what I was talking about. Now when you when you poor, right? When you broke, right? 
you sitting up here and smoking and shit, and you looking at all them rich people over there. That's Tiburon. That's the most expensive place in California to live. You right there around rich people all the time. That makes it, that's like teasing you in your face if you start. That goes back to what I think the most important thing about rap music meant to the, to the, to the ghetto, man, to the streets, is that it's an opportunity. There was no money and everything depended on your moral standards and the way that you behaved and the way that you treated people. We'd be millionaires, we'd be rich. But since it's not like that, then we're stone broke. And so that that's the only thing that I'm bitter about, is growing up poor because I missed out on a lot of things. In 1989, while Tupac attended a dance function, he met Layla Steinberg. Layla was developing workshops in which young people could express themselves. They immediately connected and arranged to meet the very next day. The very first day we met, he ended up coming from Marin City to this place with me that same day, and we did our little workshop here that night. And then from that night on, he was part of our group. He thought I was like the perfect package to get him where he needed to go. He told me what was going on at his house, and within a couple months, I realized that his mother was so addicted that his house was too dysfunctional to have a career to keep going to school. So within a couple months, he ended up coming to stay at my house. 7465 Bridget Drive. And this is the apartment that I was living in with my husband and my children. And Pac and Ray came to stay with me here. He was the sloppiest, messiest person I've ever lived with. And dirty. He would never want to wash clothes. He'd want to, like, buy new clothes so he wouldn't have to clean up and wash up. At 17, he was wide-eyed and really believed that he could change the world. I think adults should go through school again. You know, I think that I think that rich people should live like poor people and poor people should live like rich people and it should change every week. Our relationship was really a, rela a relationship that we searched for knowledge, you know, we explored together. And I'll just tell you a book right now, you know, it's been around for a long time. It's called Ponder on This. The stuff we were exploring together, food for thought, alignment, the ancient mysteries, astrology, the Buddha, challenge, Christ, the impact of color, our state of consciousness, medicine, the moon, the occult teachings, Rajneesh, telepathy, the Kabbalah, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. He read Roots a number of times, Talar Chardin, the phenomenon of man. And as you study Tupac's lyrics, you start to know and understand how much he incorporated his reading, even his last albums. So Pop would read a book like this, you know, it's a pretty big book, and he would attack people's definitions. So what is cultural literacy? And who defines it? And is this white perspective or is this multicultural perspective? There should be a drug class. There should be sex education. There should be a class on scams. There should be a class on religious cults. There should be a, a class on police brutality. There should be a class on apartheid. There should be a class on racism in America. There should be a class on why people are hungry, but they're not. Their class is on gym. This right here is the first hall that Tupac performed in. And it was the Craft, EC Craft Community Building. And Pac did this with Digital Underground, packed the place. I had talked to Atrin and I wanted to get us a deal and he said we had to make a video. We decided to have our own mini concert here on the grass so that we should, could show Atrin how tight we were. And so all the kids in the building were our audience right here on the grass. And that was the stage behind the trees. And we had the Strictly Dope show. Now, 